Good morning. Alleluia. Christ is risen. We rejoice that the Lord is risen indeed. And we praise the Lord this morning as we gather together. We're delighted that you're worshiping with us this morning. And if you're visiting with us from wherever you may be, we extend a warm welcome to you this morning in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. We hope that you find our service meaningful today and filled with the Holy Spirit. And I have several announcements regarding our life together. The session met this past Tuesday evening. And out of concern for our members and for our community, they voted, we voted, to extend our campus closing until at least May 31st. We hope to be back together on Pentecost Sunday, but we'll monitor the situation. The, si the safety of our members and our entire community is our primary concern, and we are aware and are preparing for what lies ahead, and we are getting ready for that time when we might gather back together again, even if that is uncertain at this moment in time. We thank all of you for your prayers and for your support as we seek to make the best decisions we can with the information that we have at our disposal. So to that end, there will be some opportunities for us to continue to engage one another and the text for the week ahead. I'm going to be hosting a Bible study this coming week on the Zoom platform, a video uh, platform that we've used for meetings and many of you are probably getting more and more familiar with in these days. The first study will be at 10 a.m. on Tuesday morning and the other one will be Wednesday afternoon at 3 p.m. You can email me at andy at clpc.us. That's my name, andy at clpc.us. For the invitation to join that Bible study, I'll send you the link once you email me. I'll be sending you the text as well of what I'm looking to preach on for the coming week. And your insights will help inform the sermon as we go ahead. So um, I look forward for that time for us to gather together through study. Last, the session also approved the opportunity for us to gather together at the Lord's table and celebrate communion. We'll do that on May 3rd, the first Sunday of the month. Our custom is to celebrate the sacrament of communion on the first Sunday of the month. We'll do that again in our online worship format. I will lead us in the liturgy at the table and we'll invite you to partake of the elements in your homes, uh, elements of juice and bread. We wanted to let you know ahead of time so that you have the opportunity to get those materials and um, so that you're ready to celebrate the sacrament with us on the 3rd. The e-courier next week will have information, some more information about that. Also, it will be an education time, a little bit about Presbyterian understanding of communion and why we use the elements that we do. So look forward to that. And now let us continue to worship God this morning in this space.
As we continue our worship, let us pray together. Almighty God, Jesus, our risen Lord, was made known to the disciples in the breaking of the bread. Forgive us when we fail to recognize your blessing and keep your word. Help us to live in peace and reflect your love in the world. Open the eyes of our hearts that we may recognize Christ's presence. And with his disciples cry out, the Lord has risen indeed. Through Christ who lives and reigns with you in the power of the Holy Spirit, we pray this day. Amen. Friends, let your hearts be still, for God loves you and forgives you all your wrongdoing. Beloved, receive the peace of Christ and know that you are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, you opened the meeting of the scriptures to the disciples on the road to Emmaus and set their hearts ablaze. By the power of your spirit, kindle our hearts as we hear your word proclaimed, that we may receive you with joy. Amen. The first scripture reading is Psalm 67. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face to shine upon us, that your way may be known upon earth, your saving power among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you judge the peoples with equity and guide the nations upon earth. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. The earth has yielded its increase. God, our God, has blessed us. May God continue to bless us. Let all the ends of the earth revere him. The second scripture reading is from Luke chapter 24, verses 13 through 35. Now on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, 
and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? He asked them, what things? They replied, the things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, oh, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself and all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly saying, stay with us because it is almost evening and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed it and broke it and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, were not our hearts burning with us, within us while he was talking to us on the road while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour, they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the 11 and their companies gathered together. They were saying, the Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, today's text is well known to many of us. We usually read it right after Easter. You may remember it being read mostly at Easter time because this account takes place on that first Easter Sunday according to Luke. Last week we heard John's first Easter Sunday account, the second half of it, the evening part of it. And today we're hearing Luke's version of what happened that first Easter evening. There are many nuggets that can be taken out of this story, just like any story uh, in Scripture, and kind of like we did last week. One of the things that stands out to me from this particular text is when the text says, he took bread, he blessed it, and their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, talking about the two companions on the road. I know we all long for times in which we recognize God's presence among us. I know I do, especially when we're transformed because we've had an encounter with the divine, the holy, when suddenly and unexpectedly we find that God is right in our midst and we didn't expect it or we didn't even know it at the time, but all of a sudden we realize that God's there. I, I wonder if you've had those experiences too. And also, just on a personal level, we, we want to be recognized, we want to be known, we want to be accepted. But not just in times of trouble and distress, when we ache to be recognized by God, but really just among community, we, we like to be known and, and recognized for who we are, appreciated and valued and not forgotten. Now, I think I've mentioned this to you before, but that last part, the not forgotten part, 
is one in which I struggle. It's a terrible trait for a minister. I will own it, and I'll own it every day. But it's one of my worst traits. It's one of the things that I, I really struggle with. You may remember me telling you last summer when I was first with you that I needed you to introduce yourselves to me every week because I would study the pictorial directory as best I could. But not everybody was in the directory and not everybody was here last summer. So you might introduce yourself to me one Sunday and not be here the next or you, you might have not have been here that Sunday, but you are. And I just needed that consistency. And, and one of the issues with the directory, if you remember me pointing out, was you all changed clothes. You didn't wear the same things that you wore when you had your picture taken. So I had a hard time recognizing your faces and re remembering your names. Now, again, this is something that's followed me throughout my ministry. Before we moved here, I served a number of different places in South Carolina. I was in campus ministry, and so I worked with a lot of church sessions and mission teams and young adult teams, college ministry teams, different groups within all the churches in Greenville County. That was about 10 or 11 churches at the time. I also would be asked to preach on occasion when friends would go out of town because I didn't have Sunday morning responsibilities. So I would go and preach for different churches and and get to know people there. Sometimes I would go back on over the course of several months. So we'd kind of get to know people in those places. And then I served in different interim and state supply positions as well, served on different presbytery committees and, and chaired some of those. So got to know a lot of different people in a lot of different church communities. At last count, I had served or preached in 32 of the 58 churches in our presbyteries. Quite a high number. Not all of them were big churches. Some of them were really small. But I would see people often and not know how I knew them. I wouldn't quite recognize and couldn't remember if I knew them from this church or that church or which church. And one of the most embarrassing times happened when I was serving a church called Providence Presbyterian Church in Powdersville, South Carolina, just outside of Greenville. I went to the hospital to see someone. I'd only been in the church for a couple weeks, and we get the call in the church office. Someone's in the hospital, and they request that the pastor comes to see them. So I went to the hospital. It wasn't in Powdersville. Powdersville is a small town. It was in the metropolis of Anderson, South Carolina, if you know that. It's not a big town either. But it was the closest hospital. So I went to, went to the Anderson Hospital. And I'd never been there before. Never been to this hospital. But I did what all ministers do when we go to the hospital. I did my confident preacher's walk. It's the walk where we're just, we walk around like this, like we know what we're doing. And we're on staff. And we, everybody knows. We're communicating to them. I got this. I don't need any help. I'm good to go. Except at this hospital, I really had no idea. Uh, after I left the lobby and went up to the elevators, which took me a long time to find, and I, I couldn't find the lobby if you told me I had to go back to it. I didn't know where the ICU was. I didn't know where this hospital room was. And so I was doing my best confident preacher walk as I'm walking around the, the, the halls and trying to subtly read the signs and, you know, look like I know what I'm doing when it's very clear I don't. And after about the third time I passed the visitor desk, I make eye contact with the volunteer there long enough for her to know this guy has no idea what he's doing. And she was just about to ask me if she could help, but then she stopped and she said, hey, I know you. I said, oh, well, you know, I'm Andy Casto Waters. I'm the new minister, state supply minister down the road at Providence Presbyterian Church over in Powdersville. And she smiled at me and kind of cocked her head and said, well, it's good to see you, Pastor. I'm Ruth Thomas, and I'm a member at Providence Presbyterian Church just down the road in Powdersville. And that, now I was really sweating. I mean, I was already a little worked up and nervous from the confident pastor walk situation, but now this is the embarrassing sweat. How are you going to, how are you going to recover from this? And I said, of course you are, Ruth. Like she was going to lie to me and that wasn't her name. I said, I just didn't recognize you or I definitely didn't know you volunteered here. Just didn't expect to see you here. She laughed it off, thankfully. Ruth is a good Presbyterian. She laughed and, uh, you know, we had a, a good chuckle about it. And then she told me where I needed to go. I mean, you know, to find the room, not in the way that you tell someone when they just insulted you. And 
I made the visit and I went back to the church and come Sunday morning when I'm standing out back there and greeting people as they leave, Ruth looks at me and says, now do you know who I am? I said, of course I know who you are, Ruth. It's good to see you in worship again. I, I asked everybody, where does Ruth sit? I studied that directory to make sure I could recognize her. I studied old directories to see if I could pick her out from previous years. I wanted to make sure I knew who Ruth was and actually everybody else as well. I did the best I could trying to learn. And the next time I went back to the hospital, I kept an eye out just in case Ruth was volunteering so I could recognize her in the hospital. We all like to be recognized, acknowledged, both by others and by God. We, we do not like to be forgotten. And we really long to know that God is always with us. The other thing, another thing about this text that stood out to me was not just the recognizing their eyes being open, was that even though Jesus was with them the whole time, they didn't know who he was. If you heard Tim read, the text is saying us and we and we language. You get the sense that these two disciples, Cleopas and the other one who's not named, you get the sense that they had been in that larger following of Jesus' disciples, that they had heard him preach in the temple, they had heard him teach, they had maybe seen some of the, the healings that he had done, so you would think they would recognize who he is. But they, he's a total stranger to them. Not only is he a total stranger, they act like he's just from a completely different planet. Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem, they say? Are you the only one who doesn't know the things that have taken place here the last few days? And Jesus says, well, what things? And you can almost see Cleopas' shoulders just drop. It's like all the air goes out of him as he begins to tell the story about the things that were taking place, the things that had just happened in Jerusalem, how they had hoped that Jesus was the one, that he was the Messiah, the long-awaited Messiah, to lead the people, and how the religious leaders took him and tried him and crucified him and killed him. And now it's the third day, and you may remember me saying uh, some weeks ago, the third day, the day, the critical day, when the spirit was to believe to have completely left the body. It's now the third day since those things have taken place. He's gone. He's dead. There's no coming back from it, they almost say. And not only that, but the strangest thing is the women went to the tomb early this morning, and they didn't see him, but they saw some angels, and they went back and told the others, and they went to the tomb, and they didn't see him there either. We don't know what's going on. I don't know if you heard how Jesus reacted when they tell him all of these things. He doesn't scold them for being sad. He doesn't scold them for being discouraged or, or skeptical. Instead, he says to them, how foolish you are, how hard of heart to believe Oh, slow of heart to believe all that the prophets had said. It had nothing to do with their disappointment. It had nothing to do with their despair. It had to do with their lack of biblical interpretation for not connecting the dots between the Torah and the prophets and the scriptures that pointed to who Jesus was. It talked about who the Messiah was and how God acted through Jesus in the world. It would be interesting to know what Jesus said to them as he started to open up the scriptures, we can imagine that he spoke for a long time. If you look at a map, Emmaus is believed to have been about seven miles from Jerusalem. It takes a long time to walk seven miles, especially if you're weighed down by sorrow. So Jesus begins with the Torah, begins with Moses. He goes to the prophets. He goes to the scriptures that talk about who he is, that point to the work that he did in the world and how he was the fulfillment of all of that. And we can imagine it takes a little while. But even still, we don't get the sense that they begin to understand everything that's going on, even after Jesus opens the scriptures to them. But despite their ignorance and despite their inability to believe, they make one request of this stranger Jesus. They say, stay with us. The night is getting on, it's getting late, it's not safe to travel alone, so stay with us tonight, share a meal with us, and you can set out tomorrow morning after you've rested. Be at the table, share a meal, rest, comfort us with your presence. You get the sense that these two are so grief-stricken, 
that they're bringing each other down and someone else might help lift the mood. Suddenly, the guest becomes the host. Sit, Jesus says, rest, eat. And he prays, as he prays, they start to know who he is. They start to recognize him. Their eyes are opened as he breaks the bread and gives it to them. They recognize who he is. Their eyes are open. They know at once who Jesus is, and all is not lost. They start to realize all hope is still alive. There's no reason to despair. And even though, even though in that instant Jesus vanishes from their sight, they're still overcome with hope and wonder. They think back on the conversation. They think back on their travels. They say, were not our hearts burning within us as he opened up the scriptures to us? One of the former moderators of our denomination, Susan Andrews, Andrews calls this feeling holy heartburn. She says that the story that we're reading today of these particular disciples is actually our story as well. That on most Sunday mornings, churchgoers prepare for an encounter with the risen Lord. Modern disciples, she said, they come through the doors of the church. They're straggling through the church. They're weighed down by the burdens of the world, by cynicism, by stress, by pretense, by power. They may even these days come to their computer screens in those ways. And we disciples today, like those first disciples we read about in the text, we want to be in the living presence of God. But in some ways, we're too preoccupied, we're too stressed, we're too suspicious to be able to fully recognize God in our midst, she says. In our objective world of fact and truth and matter and money, the church's world of mystery and meaning and risk and relationship seems silly. It just doesn't all make sense. We long for burning hearts that assure us that God is with us But at times we're unprepared for just such an encounter. And yet, even still, even in the midst of our being unprepared, Jesus seeks us out. Jesus, in both today's text, the story from last week, and in our lives, meets us where we are. The stranger on the road to Emmaus took the skepticism and the curiosity of those disciples and wove them in the fabric of Scripture. The intersection of tradition with the immediacy of Christ's own flesh lit a fire in the hearts of those who traveled with him. And finally, Susan says, in the intimacy of breaking bread at the table, the eyes of the disciples were opened and they recognized the stranger for who he was. They recognized the presence of the resurrected God right there in their midst. I really like that line, she said, the intersection of tradition with the immediacy of Christ's own flesh lit a fire in the hearts of those who traveled with him. I think that sums up the good news of the gospel. It sums up who we are as followers, that even in times of ignorance or skepticism or doubt or confusion or quarantine or social distancing, Jesus comes to us and meets us where we are. That he's able to weave together our tradition and experiences into his own body. And in the intersection of all of that, our hearts burn within us because we know that we're in the midst of God's presence. Hopefully we know that. I mean, at first the disciples didn't quite recognize that. The two in our group, they get up, they hurry back to Jerusalem, again, another seven-mile journey. And they see the disciples gathered in the room talking about their experiences of seeing the Lord. Then these two tell them what happened to them. And then Jesus comes into the room like last week and says, Peace be with you. And the disciples, instead of worshiping God or praising or giving thanks or any of those things, are terrified. They think that they're seeing a ghost. They can't believe that Christ is in their midst again. Jesus invites them to touch his wounds. He asks them for a piece of bread to eat to prove that he is actually alive, but they're still filled with doubt and with wonder. 
doubt and wonder. Two peas in a pod. But I think both are critical for our faith, quite honestly. Because faithful doubting leads us to exploration. It leads us to study. It leads us to discovery and wonder. Doubting that greed is an acceptable lifestyle instead of generosity leads to changed communities. Doubting that we live only for ourselves leads to living lives of God's grace. Doubting that the ways of the world with its hostility and suspicion and ridicule and judgment, that, that that's the norm. Doubting that, that that is the norm leads to friendliness and openness and encouragement and acceptance. And it leads us all to live lives as God wants us to live, as, as if God has the last word, as if God is in charge. When our hearts burn within us, when our tradition and our experiences intersect with the immediacy of Christ's own flesh, a fire is lit in our hearts. Those who, who seek Christ, those who travel with him on their journeys, the one who breaks through in unexpected ways despite our doubts or our lack of understanding meets us where we are, meets us as we are, guides us and pushes us to be more than we can imagine, to be what God intends for us to be. And sometimes trying to figure out what God intends for us is the hard part. We think that we're to be something and we carry on in that direction, not knowing or realizing that perhaps God is calling us to be something else. And then a major life event or world event causes us to re-examine all we thought to have been true. But the good news is that once Jesus asks us what things are going on, and we act like he's the only person in the world who doesn't know what's happening, that we're in a lockdown or economic pandemic or virtual everything, that encounter with the risen one leads us to this kind of holy heartburn. I know that your hearts have burned within you from your encounters with God. John Calvin says that's one of the surest, surest signs that the Spirit dwells within us, that your heart burns for the Lord. So this week, keep walking bravely down the Emmaus Road, trusting and knowing that not only is God leading us to that place, but God is walking right along beside of us in our journeys. God is in the midst of us, however we gather together. And God is doing great things in and among us. May our hearts burn strongly in the days and weeks to come. May they burn with God's love, comfort us with God's spirit, and strengthen us in the knowledge that Christ is with us, going before us, going beside us, leading us. Thanks be to God for leading us in faith. Alleluia. Amen. And let us affirm our faith together, saying some of what we believe using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. As we prepare to offer our prayers for the world, for our community, for the church, and for those that we love, we lift up these prayer concerns this morning as we gather together. We remember Pam Darst, who has been in the hospital and ill and um, will be undergoing further tests in coming weeks. It is not coronavirus related, but uh, we still keep her in our prayers. We keep Tim Baldwin in our prayers as he is undergoing radiation treatments. 
We remember Pat, Lowell, and Greg Hoffman and continue to keep them in our prayers as Pat and Greg both have been diagnosed with COVID-19 and Pat was in the hospital uh, undergoing treatment for a kidney stone. We remember Larry Johnson and his family and the death of his brother Chuck this past week. We lift up Pastor Clinton and Amy's daughter and son-in-law, both of whom have mild cases of COVID-19, and Scott and Helen Huffington's, excuse me, Scott and Helen Heffington's mother lives in an assisted living facility where several cases of the virus have been reported. We remember all of them. We remember us all in this time. As we come to God in prayer again, we'll have an opportunity for a response to our prayers this morning. Each petition will conclude with God of the resurrection, and you're invited to respond. Hear our prayer. So let us unite in pray, our hearts in prayer this morning, saying, God of the resurrection, hear our prayer. Let us pray. We pray this day, O God, for the church throughout the world, that as we celebrate the great days of Easter, we may renew our faith and strengthen our witness in Jesus' name. God of the resurrection, hear our prayer. We pray this day for pastors and teachers and ministers, especially for our state of clerk, for our moderators, for the moderator of our presbytery and our synod leaders as well, that all may recognize the risen Christ in word and sacrament, and they may lead your church with wisdom, humility, and courage. God of resurrection, hear our prayer. We pray for the governments of the world and its leader, especially our government and our governor, all of our elected officials, that they may be guided by wisdom and serve the common good. God of resurrection, hear our prayer. We pray for our planet Earth, that all people may be good stewards of its resources and share in its abundance. God of resurrection, hear our prayer. We pray for the poor and the stranger, that they may receive a place of refuge and hope and that the church may offer the hospitality the first disciple offered to Jesus on the road to Emmaus. God of resurrection, hear our prayer. We pray for the sick and for those in distress, that they may find healing for their pain and be restored to fullness of life. God of resurrection, hear our prayer. We pray for those who help the sick and those who serve our community in so many ways. Be with them and be their strength, their comfort, their shield, and their provider. God of resurrection, hear our prayers. We pray for our neighbors, that we may live in peace and share our resources. God of resurrection, hear our prayer. We pray for our enemies, that they may receive good things, and that we, your servants, may not return evil for evil. God of resurrection, hear our prayer. Almighty God, receive these prayers we offer this day, and by the power of your Holy Spirit, make us witnesses to the glorious resurrection of Jesus Christ, through whom we pray as he taught his disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
We're grateful for God's gifts to us, and most importantly, we're grateful for the gift of salvation that's ours in Jesus Christ, our risen Lord. We give our offerings to God, hoping that his love and grace extends beyond the walls of our sanctuary and our church and into the community. We pray that Christ blesses what we have and that he gives it to those in need so that their eyes of the world may be opened and that all may recognize him. A reminder that you may send in your offerings by check in the mail to here to the church here. You may also donate online. We give thanks to those of you who've been able to sustain us. We pray with those of you for whom economic hardships at this time are a reality. We give thanks to God, the giver of all good things, the provider of all that we need. And out of that thanks, let us offer our prayers to God once again. Let us pray. Almighty God, by your grace, accept the fruit of our labor and the offering of our lives. Let us be a sacrifice of thanksgiving in union with our risen Lord, who lives and reigns with you forever. Amen. Go in the joy of the resurrection. Purify your souls. Be obedient to the truth. Be genuine in love through the living and enduring word of the Lord. We hear those words and that, those commands in Peter's first letter, chapter 1, 22 to 23. May the grace of our risen Lord Jesus Christ. May the love of God who raised him from the dead, may the power of the Holy Spirit who fills the world with new life be with you, those whom you love, and all people this day and forevermore. Amen. Thank you for joining us on YouTube for our Sunday morning worship. Cypress Lake Presbyterian Church is located in beautiful Fort Myers, Florida. If you are interested in attending a worship service, please visit our website at www.clpc.us for the current worship times. We hope God has blessed you with the Bible passage and message from this video. If you'd like to see more videos from Cypress Lake Presbyterian Church, please subscribe to our channel and click the notification bell to receive all of our updates. Have a blessed day.